started. Uh, right. Um, so, uh, hello everyone. Good morning. Um, today we'll be talking about, or this uh, talk is going to be about spiking neural networks. Specifically, I have, in order to make sure that, you know, from this tutorial or education class, we get the most out of this education class. So I thought instead of covering both hardware, algorithm, and all those aspects together, I thought I'll streamline this education class mostly around algorithms. Um, and then, of course, some of the uh, efficiency benefits that we get, we will talk about it. But mostly this talk is going to be about spiking neural networks, some um, uh, what has been uh, some of the past trends and the present trends and uh, how we are adding on to those trends and what is the future of spiking neural networks from an algorithmic perspective uh, looks like, right? So that is going to be what uh, the outline of our presentation today. Uh, now, in terms of the logistics, I think because this is going to be pretty much free flow, so feel free to unmute yourself and stop me whenever you have a question or you can uh, put a question on chat. And what I'm going to do is like, you know, every uh, 15 minutes or so or in every 10 minutes, I'm going to check the chat if there are any questions I can uh, um, uh, answer those questions, but uh, feel free to unmute yourselves and uh, post a question if you have anything. And I think there is somebody who is doing looking uh, the admin team here. If they can just give me a cue point at any time, whenever there is a chat, in case I have not looked at it, it'll be great. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, little before we get started, just a little background on me. Uh, I am Priya Panda. I'm an assistant professor in the electrical engineering department at uh, Yale University. Um, and my key focus area is on neuromorphic computing. I have been looking at uh, how to develop novel uh, bio-inspired algorithms, specifically around spiking neural networks in order to enable the next generation of energy efficient as well as robust machine intelligence. And at the same time, from a hardware perspective, we have been looking at complementary uh, CMOS uh, uh, as well as um, emerging technology-based uh, uh, design of hardware for such spiking neural networks as well as standard neural networks and trying to see how much of acceleration we can obtain. Um, so um, before we kind of get into the talk, I thought it would be a good idea to give a brief uh, history of how neural networks have evolved. And at each and every stage of evolution, there has been very interesting levels of biofidelity um, uh, between um, the neural networks and that of the brain. So when initially in the 1940s, when perceptrons ca came into being, uh, the idea was that like, you know, um, uh, that whenever you have any inputs, as you see here, uh, you can pass them through a weighted summation operation and that weighted summation operation followed by a nonlinearity. And in this case, uh, in with perceptrons, they specifically used uh, a nonlinearity of a threshold function um, or a binary threshold function. And they showed that you can do very simple classification tasks uh, with such perceptron based networks. Now, artificial neural networks, which are sort of, which came in the 1990s, and it so happens that the convolutional networks, which began the deep learning rev revolution, are all based on these artificial neural networks. But if you look at it, they also have the same uh, fundamental crux. That means they still have the inputs that pass through a weighted summation operation, right? And here, the only change they did was that instead of having a thresholding nonlinearity, people started using more uh, continuous forms of nonlinearity. And by that, uh, there are certain uh, different forms of nonlinearity people experimented with, sigmoid, tan edge, rectified linear unit, or ReLU, as um, uh, you must all be aware, that that is probably, uh, that is uh, uh, currently the most used nonlinearity in any deep learning network, right? Uh, and as I said, these convolutional neural networks, which ultimately began the deep learning revolution and now have kind of taken off on, on another level, um, and that can do a lot of tasks, right? Not just recognition, but beyond recognition tasks, for example, segmentation, even like a lot of natural language processing based uh, models, they not only rely on um, recurrent based models, but they have some kind of a convolutional hierarchy also, the transformer based models, et cetera, they all have some so, sort of con convolutional hierarchy. And the idea is that these convolutional networks 
they of course have some interesting operations like a convolution operation a pooling operation that helps them uh, do image processing in in a much more efficient manner but at the end of the day they still are relying on the same operations which is the weighted summation operation followed by a non linearity and in this case again the non linearity that they use is relu now we all know that deep learning has broken all records in the recent past i mean there was alpha go i'm showing alpha go by google deep mind uh, in 20 uh, 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 in 2014 they showed that um, uh, the alpha go with uh, google deep mind was able to uh, defeat the then go champion lee sedol uh, in a go match and the kind of uh, points they had was alpha go was uh, 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 four points ahead of lee sedol so now that's a truly tremendous feat on the part of ai and if you look at like very recent announcements from uh, the deep mind team they have come up with this uh, techno uh, this algorithm called alpha fold that allows you to do some dna genome sequencing very very fast and it's all ai based right uh, so that, now those are really tremendous feats on the part of ai but one question you got to ask is when alpha go is playing against lee sedol what kind of resources is alphago expending in order to defeat lisa doll right so you know alphago like these are numbers we took from uh, some of their announcements that alphago was running on around 2000 cpus and 300 gpus and consuming around a few like you know uh, hundreds of watts of power on over on the range of around 1 megawatt but lisa doll's brain or an average human brain in general expends 20 watts of power and we and in that case like lisa doll's brain is not only play, playing the go thing but he's probably you know understanding how to make the next moves he's trying to drink coffee so all those things like you know our brain now we just don't recognize right we are we are we do a lot of variety of tasks the fact that i'm moving my hands the fact that i'm talking the fact that i'm thinking as to what is my next line all of that is happening within a power budget of 20 watts so this is pretty incredible so our brain does a a variety of cognitive tasks but at a very low power budget right so the basic idea of the next generation of neural networks that are being explored today is to see actually how can you get brain like functionality but with the brain like efficiency so with artificial neural networks convolutional networks the focus was on how to get more brain like functionality and people have done uh, there's a lot of work on machine learning that has come up that has shown that you can really really uh, start um, doing a variety of tasks and e even getting superhuman performance or surpass human performance on some of these tasks but the efficiency was still not a central goal in some when these algorithms came up and more and more right now as artificial intelligence is being th th thought of as you know becoming more ubiquitous as you want to embed uh, intelligence in all technology that surrounds us power efficiency or energy efficiency becomes a key concern because more or less today all the devices that are surrounding us today these are all battery powered devices so they have some kind of a budget limit in terms of how much computations you can expend for a given amount of time right so to that effect spiking neural networks kind of offer a very interesting and an elegant solution of course they are brain inspired so if you think of a, how a spiking neural network looks like here you see that in this case all the inputs right they also pass through a weighted summation operation and then here the um, a question is that what kind of a neuron you use so we use a different kind of a spiking neuron instead of a relu non linearity function we use a spiking non linearity function and this neuronal functionality is generally um, uh, implemented using a leaky integrate fire or an integrate fire neuron and i'll talk about that later but one thing to note here is that inputs and outputs are produced in the form of spikes that means so spikes are essentially a one or a zero event right so when a spike is present that means there is a one being processed and if a spike is absent let's say here in this region there is no spike present that means a zero is being processed right so if you think about it we are able to do this very efficient event driven sparse event driven processing so a neuron will only be active whenever it processes a spike so you know by handling computations and communication using events or using these binary sparse events we can actually reduce the computational cost of these uh, neural networks a, a, um, by orders of magnitude and that is why a lot of there is a lot of interest in seeing how spiking neural networks can enable the next generation of intelligence algorithms 
now again to kind of give you an a more motivation around why is efficiency uh, uh, why is uh, uh, efficiency or energy efficiency such a key concern so i'm going to show you a case study that uh, was done um, uh, from this group at purdue and what the, the case study uh, dealt with was that they conducted an object recognition rec uh, application on a smart class with a state of the art accelerator so essentially uh, they took a google edge tpu and they wanted to see what is like you know what is the kind of latency throughput and like you know the power constraints that this google edge tpu has right so they essentially implemented this particular deep neural network which is called retina net which is uh, a pretty standard uh, 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 neural network for doing object recognition and they found out that the performance on this edge tpu was around 13.3 frames per second and as per the, when they try to measure like you know when they were running this recognition application on the edge tpu how much what was the kind of battery life they uh, they got so they found out that you know in this edge tpu the energy per operation was around 0.5 uh, picojoules and to that effect based on the overall throughput they cal could calculate the energy per frame and based on that for a battery uh, which has a, a use a life uh, usage of 2.1 watt hour they found out that if you keep on running this object recognition application continuously on this htpu the time to die for that battery is going to be 64 minutes so this tells what does this tell you that if you have this htpu in like say a mobile processor or a smart glass or something you have to keep on recharging that device every 60 minutes right and that is not something which is feasible or practical right so you really need to think about how to bridge these inefficiencies or how to get rid of these inefficiencies and in order to understand that you first have to ask the question where do the inefficiencies come from they can come from the fact that you know maybe you have an inefficient algorithm to begin with the kind of hardware architecture that you are using has some kind of inefficiency or it is not able to implement the software in the best manner so it's not able to extract out all the throughput of the efficiency that you want it to extract and of course can you come up with better circuits and devices like you know can you look at more efficient uh, technology um, uh, and the, uh, the such that the physics of that device the physics of that technology will itself match with some of the functionality that you are wanting to implement on an algorithmic level so 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 the question is that in order to kind of you know think about how to bridge these inefficiencies gap people started thinking about you know can we take cues from the brain and why the brain because it is the most uh, um uh, uh, like if you think about intelligence i mean you know uh, brain is the most efficient and the most powerful natural intelligent machine out there so it is but natural that we will take inspiration from the brain in order to understand how we can do intelligence in a much faster in a much efficient manner so the cues that we want to learn from the brain is that you know can we come up with better neuronal models because in the brain of course you know um, a computation doesn't happen with, with use, using these kind of values and all uh, what they say is that computation in the brain the computation is much more timing specific that means when a, a, it, it's also spike driven which is similar to what spiking neural networks have and the neuron itself is more like a stochastic neuron it produces spikes in a stochastic manner it can be a discrete neuron like a, a leaky integrate fire which i'll talk about so can we kind of you know by integrating such brain like neuronal functionality will we be able to bridge the inefficiency gap is the question secondly a learning algorithms right like you know is back propagation the best learning algorithm there is or are there some interesting local learning algorithms that we can use that can actually improve um, uh, the training efficiency as well as the inference efficiency as well as make the network more capable right yeah when i talk about learning algorithms i need to think about you know how to improve the generalization behavior of the network etc and then of course the network topology i mean in the brain everything is not feed forward there's a lot of feedback connections and what they say is that the number of feedback connections are kind of kind of overpower the number of feed forward connections in the brain and today if you think about most of the neural networks that we work with they do not have any feedback connections as as such right so how to incorporate feedback maybe feedback can play a big role in terms of uh, 
error resiliency as well as uh, in maintaining the energy. Uh, and finally, of course, when you think about the computing principles of the brain, I mean, there is not nothing synchronous in the brain. Everything is asynchronous. This neuron can fire at one time step. This neuron is doing its own thing at that uh, at another time step. Uh, and of course, we know that in the brain, the memory and the compute, and by memory means that like, you know, whatever, like uh, in the brain, the memory is corresponding to the synapses, right? That's where all the learning happens. And the compute in the brain corresponds to the neuron, which sends information or receives information so the memory the neurons and the synapses in the brain are very very tightly integrated and co-located but if you think of a von neumann processor that we have today the processor and the memory are separate from each other so there's a lot of interesting work going on around near memory computing in memory computing and i think there is some interesting tutorial after and the 11 o'clock session on such a um, in memory computing and the near memory computing based works and that can also give you that orders of magnitude of efficiency that you would like when you kind of go for this kind of algorithm hardware co-design uh, in order to do brain inspired computing now as i said like you know while the topic of spiking neural networks uh, can span over algorithms hardware and across the entire computing stack from devices to circuits to systems to um, uh, architectures and then algorithms but uh, uh, just to make sure that we there is um, uh, like we take away most of the information from this talk i'm going to focus on the algorithm aspects of things okay right uh, is there are there any questions so far Okay, if not, then I'll move ahead and just repeating again, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or put a question on chat and I will be checking the chat uh, intermittently. Okay, so before we move, sorry, uh, before we move on to like, you know, uh, spiking algorithms, first of all, I want to kind of talk to you about what are the major differences uh, between a standard artificial neural network that we all know we have worked with extensively versus a spiking neural network, right? Uh, so, if you look at it, the spiking network in an artificial neural network in terms of configuration, in terms of the network architecture that we talk about, right, can be the same. So, I'm showing you an example of a fully connected network here, but we can have the same VGG-like convolutional networks or a ResNet-like convolutional network architecture. So, all of that can remain the same. The network configuration will be the same. The only thing is that here inputs and outputs are real valued in an ANN, whereas in an SNN, the inputs and the outputs are spikes, right? And there are different coding techniques that are used in order to convert a corresponding input into a spike train. So generally what we use, like, you know, the most widely used coding technique is called rate coding, wherein sorry, uh, wherein you actually uh, produce a spike train, wherein the number of spikes in that spike train will be proportional to the value of the input. So let's say, you know, you have this RGB image with some pixel intensities in uh, across in at every pixel location. So you produce a spike train for each and every pixel location, okay, wherein the frequency of the spikes or the number of spikes in that spike train will be proportional to the pixel intensity. So higher the pixel value, higher will be the number of spikes and lower the pixel value, lower will be the number of spikes, which is something that is captured here also. So for a 0.5, you will have more number of spikes, whereas for a 0.1, you have you will have less number of spikes. Now, when should we produce a spike, right? And when I say spike, this basically means an event. So all these red lines means that I have a value of one coming in, whereas um, uh, if there are no red lines here, that means a value of zero is being co is coming in, right? Now, the time at which this particular one will be produced, a spike will be produced, that is not in my hand. That is produced all randomly. So I use a Poiso distribution in order to generate these spikes randomly, right? Um, so there is some kind of a stochasticity in the spike generation process. Uh, but okay, uh, now that we know, like you know, the structure is the same. Uh, how we process the inputs and how we process the outputs is going to be different, right? Here it is real valued in SNNs, it is all uh, uh, spike based. Uh, now, if you look into the neuronal functionality itself, there you will see that there is some interesting, again, differences here. Now, again, in both the cases, uh, the inputs are passed through the weighted summation operation, which is the dot product operation, okay? And now, of course, we know that in an artificial neural network or ANN, our nonlinearity that we use is a rectified linear unit nonlinearity. So after passing through a ReLU, it will produce some real valued output. Whereas in a, sorry, I think there's some animation problem here. Uh, but in an SNN, however, we know that 
after summing these uh, after wait, wait, wait uh, after the weighted summation operation on the input spikes you still have to produce an output spike right so you need to change the neuronal functionality and the neuronal functionality we use is again a bio inspired neuronal functionality which is called leaky integrate and fire so what is this leaky integrate fire function it's essentially uh, what we have is that we monitor this value called membrane potential which can be you know equivalently thought to be the activation function if i may say so so the activation function in this case is the membrane potential and the membrane potential of this neuronal functionality or neuron is going to increase that means it's going to integrate or leak based on the presence or absence of spike so whenever there is a spike it in it uh, in integrates and whenever there is no spike it leaks right so based on this behavior the leak the membrane potential of this neuron right it will go through this kind of a leaky integrate and fire behavior and whenever the membrane potential crosses a user defined threshold which i mark by v thresh that is the cue for the output neuron to produce a spike and this spike is then communicated to the rest of the network okay so that's how so this is how you are able to take the information in a spike based manner process it through weighted summation operation and process it then through the leaky integrate fire uh, functionality again to produce spikes from the output side and this is again communicated to the next layers of the network so if you go back and see like you know how the neuronal functionality of a spiking neuron looks like you have the integrate fire which is the membrane potential but there is a thresholding function right v mem greater than v thresh is this this particular module or function is going to determine whether you produce a spike or not right so if you have a thresholding function there are going to be some problems when you do gradient descent and why am i talking about gradient descent because gradient descent is the go to algorithm today right when you are trying to train your neural networks any kind of a neural network whether it's a recurrent network your um, uh, for feed forward convolutional network or anything you use some sort of a gradient descent based algorithm right as long as you're doing supervised learning right um and for gradient descent you actually need to calculate gradients that has to pass through all these neurons so you know all the neuronal functionality has to be differentiable but if you have a thresholding function as a part of the neuronal functionality that is not going to be differentiable right so because of this non differentiability there is a lot of um uh, 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 limitation in terms of how can you train spiking neural networks what is the best training algorithm for such spike based neuronal networks is the question right and um, going forward today's talk or education class is going to be about like you know the past present and the future of training how what people have come across in terms of training spike in neural networks what are the different kind of innovations people have done different kind of techniques people have done and then we will be also talking about some of the interesting aspects of robustness uh, and inherent interpretability that you can actually uh, use um, uh, you can actually interpret using uh, the timing information in the spiking neural network so so this talk is going to be kind of you know answering this question mark here as to what are the effective ways of deploying or training spiking neural networks okay um no question so far on the chat um so as i said like you know um to in order to deploy a spiking neural network we have to process information in the form of spikes right so coding techniques that take any input because we all have today we are working with digital inputs right these are like real valued inputs that are coming in at, at least from the uh, case point of images everything is real valued right uh, so how can you convert a real valued input into a spiking input remains a question and there are several coding techniques that have been used as i said like you know uh, rate coding which is when that means higher pixel values will produce more spikes uh, is kind of the most popular way of uh, uh, employing a coding scheme and that's because it's more widely used uh, because it's easy to implement on top of that it it gives you very good results whereas with there is another coding scheme called temporal coding that means if a pixel has higher value that means it will spike first and if a pixel has lower value it will spike late but it will only produce one spike so the spikes are going to be in extremely sparse uh, and that's going to be very very energy efficient but till so far temporal coding techniques have not been really have, there has not been any work that has shown the scalability and the kind of uh, um, high performing applications with temporal coding techniques so rate coding becomes like you know uh, in fact in our talk most of the algorithms that i'll be talking about focuses or uses rate coding 
Now in this image, I just want to kind of showcase like, you know, when you are taking an input image, which is this RGB valued image and putting it in the spike tray, spike dimension in the temporal dimension. And essentially what you're doing in the temporal dimension, you're binarizing it, right? So at every time step, you are binarizing the input image and producing some ones and zeros, right? That's what you're doing. Uh, but what I want to show you is that the rate coded spike image is not losing any information. So here in this case at t equal to one, I'm showing you what kind of a binary snapshot do you get when uh, you rate code this image at the first time step. Then at t equal to five, I'm just kind of adding up or summating all the in, uh, 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 events uh, that I would have produced from t equal to one till t equal to five and showing this particular value. So at every time step for, for t greater than one, t equal to five or t equal to 10 or t equal to 50, I have summed all the events or all the spike inputs from all the pixels, locations, etc. And I'm showing you how the averaged or the summed image looks like at t equal to 50 or the summed image that it looks like at t equal to 10 or 5, right? So if you look at like the original binary image, right, that you produce at every time step, whether it is t equal to one or uh, something, it's going to be actually very noisy because it's just ones and zeros. But when you start collating or summating all the information, right, you see that the grade coded image more or less resembles the original image. And if the number of time steps is large, then there will be hardly any loss of information between the original image and the uh, uh, this uh, uh, rate coded image as well. Hi, is there a question here? Okay, if not. So, um, so as I was saying, like, you know, there hardly will be any loss of information, but as the number of time steps increases, you have to think about it right now that earlier in an ANN, you had to, let's say you take a trained ANN, you will pass this uh, trained ANN only once through the uh, uh, network and you will get some inference result out of it, right? But in an SNN, now you have to pass the binary snapshots that you get, the rate coded snapshots that you get for 50 time steps or 100 time steps, depending upon how many um, um, uh, uh, such coded images you would have produced, right? Or what is the total time period of processing? So the latency of processing or the latency in case of inference, latency in case of training and SNN increases. And that is going to give you a energy overhead also, right? So you really need to be careful as to what kind of latency you work with, right? Because at the end of the day, that is going to determine your overall energy. And if your process, process well, it's a thousand time steps or 2000 time steps, then for all you know, a spiking network will be more energy consuming than an ANN because of the fact that you have to process all these binary snapshots, but thousand times through the same network. So this is not going to be very efficient. Okay. Uh, just a second. Hmm. Right. Uh, so uh, what next we will talk about, as I said, is like different training algorithms that we have. Um, uh, and I'm kind of going to give you a very historical view as in like, you know, instead of just looking at the present uh, algorithms that are like, you know, that have been, uh, that have come up in the last one or two years, I also want to kind of tell you like, you know, uh, uh, kind of give you a very historical perspective as to what initially start, people started focusing on in case of spiking neural networks and then what people are focusing on now and what kind of what are the future directions. So in terms of training algorithms, broadly, there are three types of training algorithms that people are focusing on today. One is STDP based learning, as you can see here. Uh, let me again put out my laser pointer. Yeah, one is STDP based learning, as you can see here. So it's an unsupervised learning rule. And I'll say I'll show you how exactly STDP is done. Um, now, because if it, because it is unsupervised, so that means if you think about it, a spiking neural network, if you have implemented a spiking neural network on hardware, this network will learn on its own without any supervision. You don't need to give it a label. Your training data can come in and then the network will start learning on its own. So it's a very, like, you know, for a hardware research, it's a, it was a very, very, uh, what do you say, um, attractive learning rule because people started thinking oh my god you can do real-time online learning using this kind of unsupervised local learning rule but the, the problem was that we really could not expand 
uh, the um, uh, 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 spiking as uh, HTTP based learning to deep network. So the kind of application or the kind of uh, task that we could do with the HTTP based learning was very small, like, you know, simple digit recognition on uh, MNIST data set and all of that and very shallow networks we could work with two layered or three layered. So then people were like, you know, we cannot really take this forward. So in order to improve the applicability and widen the um, usage of spiking neural networks for more diverse scenarios, what people started looking into is conversion-based networks. So your ANN to SNN conversion-based networks are pretty much today the state of the art in terms of you know, SNN deployment. So in conversion bit networks, again, as, I, I, as I'll show you that, you know, the advantage here is that you take advantage of standard ANN training. That means you take a trained ANN and then you use some kind of statistics to kind of transfer this ANN into an SNN. So the weights will all remain the same, but you have to convert a ReLU neuron to a spiking integrate fire or a leaky integrate fire neuron. And there are different methods that have come around for this also. Now, then people said like, you know, with conversion is good, but there are some limitations because of the fact that in conversion, we are really not training this network in a spike based manner. So all the inherent advantages that the spiking neural network should have because of its temporal statistics, right? Because we are putting information in a temporal manner. So there will be some interesting efficiency related things, robustness related things that will uh, that will come around in a, in a spike based network, but a converted network is not being trained in a sp using spikes right, so there will be some inherent limitations so to that effect people were like, you know, I want to go for a back propagation a spike based back propagation based spiking neural network deployment. So you train the network from scratch using spike based back propagation. And uh, the good thing is that people then started seeing that yes, you can get good accuracy or reasonable accuracy, but not as good as a converted network. And another thing about conversion, as I will show you, is that people, when initially uh, people started working on conversion, the number of time steps that was required for processing was very huge of the order of thousands. And again, with back propagation, you could reduce the number of time steps to kind of order of hundreds. Uh, but the problem was that like, you know, until last year, uh, there was still a, a, a lot of discussion around limited scalability of such um, back propagation based spiking neural networks. But I will talk to you about some of the recently proposed techniques uh, that have come out of our group that kind of addresses the limited uh, scalability and kind of um, uh, does more varied applications for spiking neural networks with back propagation. So we'll first look into uh, SDP training and then we will move on to the uh, next set of uh, uh, training techniques. So with STDP training, as I said, like we are always using the standard leak integrate fire neuron here as shown. Okay. And this is the equation that is used to implement a leak integrate fire neuron. So you have this kind of a membrane potential, right? This V is called the membrane potential and this membrane potential integrates or leaks based upon the incoming spikes coming in. Uh, and then when it uh, reaches a threshold, it will produce a spike. That's, that's all there is, right? Now with STDP learning, the interesting thing is that you are going to look into the information in terms of temporal difference. So let's say uh, you have these kind of configuration, three input neurons connected to one output neuron. And let's say all these neurons have spiked at these time instances as shown. So I1 and I3 have spiked and O1 has spiked here, okay? Now what we do with STDP learning, as I said, it's all about looking into temporal difference to do the learning. So here, O1, when you see the difference between O1 and I3, you see that O1 has spiked right after I3. So intuitively, it makes sense that, you know, there might be some correlation between the spiking of O1 and the spiking of this input I3. So because if there is a correlation, then what we will do is correspondingly, the weight W3 that connects I3 to O1, we are going to increase it. Okay, and, and we are going to increase it by an amount which is shown by this behavior here. Okay, so what this tells us is that is the, if the spike timing differences between the output and the input is very low, so it's closer to zero, I'll have a very high weight update, right? So I'm going to make a larger change to the weight because if there is more correlation, you want that weight to increase more, right? Because intuitively it makes sense that, you know, that correlation is telling us that this neuron and these neurons have some correlated spike activity and there is some interesting information to learn there. Whereas on the other hand, 
if the spike timing difference is large between the input and the output, right, where which you see in this case between O1 and I1, right, let's say there is a larger spike timing difference. So you are not going to make a very large change. So W1 is not going to have a very large change. Now, let's say on the other side also, like, you know, you, you see that, you know, O1 has spiked there. Let's say I2 would have spiked after O1. This means that there is no correlation between I2 spiking and O1 spiking because, you know, if, a, if an input is spiking after the output has spiked, there is no correlation, right? And for all you know, there is a decorrelation there. That means what if, whatever input, uh, whatever input in, uh, information you are passing through from I2 to O1, that should not be reinforced. That should be negatively, uh, 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 negatively updated. So what we do is that, you know, depending upon the, uh, depending upon the spike timing difference, again, we will make a negative weight update on W2 because there is a decorrelation here. So the main idea with this STDP or spike timing dependent plasticity learning is that you are looking at the temporal difference between the input and the output neuron spiking. And based on the temporal difference, you will decide whether you should increase the weight or synaptic strength, or you should decrease the weight or the synaptic strength. So correlation means increase and uh, decorrelation or not co no, non-correlation means decrease. Now, so that, that's the basic idea with STDP, right? It's all unsupervised. You just look at the monitor, the spike. So you pass inputs through the network, you look at the output activity, and then you let the output activity and the input activity tell you whether you should increase or decrease the weights, and you should do it you know, in an iterative manner for certain number of uh, time steps. And you see that there's some interesting unsupervised learning that happens, okay? So now if you look into like one of the first works around STDP learning was uh, proposed uh, by, uh, by a team in Europe, and this came in 2015. Uh, and they were the first people to show that you can do unsupervised digit recognition uh, using this spike timing dependent plasticity rule, right? So what they showed was like, you know, you take like, they just showed it for digit recognition task, as I said, you, so they took some, uh, they took an input image, okay? And as I said, we are doing rate coding. That means if an input image has a pixel intensity, a high pixel intensity, it will produce more spikes. Whereas if it has less intensity, so in this case, 50 has less intensity, it is producing less spikes. And if it has a high intensity, it leads to more spikes, right? Now, what in the spiking in the spike timing dependent plasticity based learning rule, the kind of network architecture you use uh, is a two layer architecture, as I will discuss right now. And this is pretty much the standard architecture that is used in all kinds of STDP based works. Most of the STDP based works use this. OK, so what you have is this kind of a fully connected configuration between the input as well as the output. And in this case, the output layer is called the excitatory layer. So it comes each of these output neuron is a leak integrate fire or a LIF spiking neuron. So, and all the pixels in the input image are fully connected to each and every output neuron here. Okay, so that's the thing. And what we do is that using, so once we start, once we rate code this image and pass it and, and uh, pass the rate coded spikes uh, to the excitatory layer, we let the network itself kind of figure out how the, which weight should be um, reinforced or uh, increased or which weight should be decreased based on this timing correlation or the timing difference. And then the network figures out. And interestingly enough, what we find, sorry, interestingly enough, we, what we find is that each and every excited neuron here learns some generic representation of the input image, okay? Now there is one caveat here, because of the fact that you are doing unsupervised learning, you really have to think about how to normalize the spiking activity and make sure you are still able to do competition, like competitive uh, learning when you are doing this. So to that effect, what people came up with is that in addition to having this excitatory uh, uh, neuronal layer here, which is uh, similar to a fully connected layer, I will also have this inhibitory layer and what is the role of the inhibitory layer is that whenever this neuron spikes, right, it will send in a signal to the inhibitory layer neuron, corresponding neuron here, right? And that neuron will then inhibit all the other neurons in the excitatory layer from spiking. So what is this telling me is that, let's say this neuron has spiked when, I, when it sees a digit input nine, 
okay that means i want this neuron to learn line actually without and every other neuron should not learn a line that i want to inhibit the activity or learning capability of other neurons and i want to make sure that when if this neuron picks up a line to learn then this is the only neuron that is picking it up because other neurons should not pick it up because i am then kind of you know redundantly learning information so that is the basic intuitive idea here of doing this inhibitory or lateral inhibition but the idea is that by doing this you can introduce competition among the excitatory neurons to learn different inputs so if this neuron is learning something it will inhibit all the other neurons from learning the same thing similarly if this neuron is learning something it will inhibit all the other neurons from learning the same thing and on top of the lateral inhibition we also employ something called homeostasis now remember like in this case it's a dynamic spiking network right we really do not touch the spiking neural network during the training process there is no supervised signal that will tell us oh you know the network has learned or something so you really have to give it some of these extrinsic control mechanism will allow the network to learn in a competitive manner even though you have not provided a supervision uh, a supervision signal so what we do is that with homeostasis what we do is once a neuron let's say has spiked right it has gone through its membrane potential behavior and it has spiked it reaches the threshold so the neuron in the excitatory layer spikes for that same neuron we will increase its threshold now what that tells us is that let's say this neuron has learned a particular pattern digit of 9 when another another pattern of 9 comes then this same neuron should not try to become greedy and learn everything right so by increasing the threshold of a neuron that has already learned something you will then allow the other neurons then to pick up some patterns to learn also so you know basically we enforce competition using lateral inhibition and we make sure that all neurons have this capability of equal learning right every neuron has a chance to learn by doing homeostasis so and these two mechanisms homeostasis and lateral inhibition are very bio inspired mechanisms that means in our brain also there is some form of homeostasis and lateral inhibition that happens um and um uh, because of the fact that this was one of the first works that showed the effectiveness of this bio plausible uh, learning mechanism on a bio plausible architecture so there were a lot of inspirations from neuroscience in building this now as i said like you know um, after um uh, after you start doing stdp what i am showing you here is the representative patterns that are being picked up by each and every neuron in this excitatory layer so you know you have to do this stdp training over a couple of iterations and you see if you just focus here if you see that initially all none of the neurons would have learned anything relevant but after a few iterations of training all these neurons will pick up something relevant and by and in this case since it is doing digit recognition so that means all the neurons are going to pick up some interesting digit patterns and if you look at the accuracy when we measured the accuracy of the network we found out that you know for a 1600 neuronal excitatory layer we found out the accuracy was 92% and for a 6400 neuron excitatory layer the accuracy was 95% now this was not enough right like for mnist the fact that the accuracy is coming out to be 95% when we know the best accuracies go up to 99% for mnist that means there is a problem here we really cannot take this up and scale it to larger data sets there is too many dynamic parameters in this problem so uh, so that so some of our uh, later works that came uh, came out was focusing on what are the advantages and disadvantages of this spike timing dependent plasticity learning and we found out that with the main disadvantage was that we cannot really go to large number of layers or deeper layers with stdp learning and even if we want to train a couple of layers more than one or more than two we really need to do like every layer has to be trained in a greedy manner that means first you train layer 1 with stdp then after that you train layer 2 then after that you layer layer learn layer 3 so you do each of these learning of layers locally and that really cannot give you a lot of interesting results and of course we still have to have some supervised back propagation at the classifier layers it's not like so you can train the convolutional layers in a stdp manner but finally when it comes to the classification task you still have to do some supervised back propagation so 
so main disadvantage was the scalability the, and the limited application that we could get so uh, of course there were some interesting advantages mostly from a hardware point of view you could do online learning on hardware using this unsupervised rule right and because you are you're not doing any gradient descent here right you are literally just finding out the timing difference so correlation is what we, um, um, uh, helps you to do this learning so it so happens that correlation is better i, I mean you know if uh, uh, Having a gradient calculator on hardware is much more energy consuming than just having a correlation module on hardware. So that's what I've written correlation terms gradient calculation from a hardware perspective, it's going to be more efficient. And of course, it's more suitable for edge learning and inference because you can do online learning. But as I said, but there is a caveat here that the applications are very limited. So the question was then like, you know, can we like, is the SDP then is absolutely, you know, is there any relevance to SDP? So what we asked was, can we utilize this temporal property to do something more? And I'm just going to very quickly go over the slide because this is something uh, of, a, of one of our previous works, which showed that, you know, actually this temporal property can be utilized in some interesting way to do continual learning. Okay. And by continual learning, what we are trying to do is that let's say you have this network which has resource constraints. That means you have a fixed size network, you cannot grow the network, but you have to keep on learning new information as and when it comes. So how do you do it? Now, one simple idea is that can we forget something unimportant or old in order to learn new information, right? So that is the key idea that we utilized and we came up with this variant of synaptic uh, spike timing dependent plasticity called adaptive synaptic plasticity which we uh, which was which allowed us to do learning to forget now what was learning to forget again as i said that we have constant number of resources so let's say in this case i have just nine neurons to learn uh, to learn with okay in this sdp based network now if i learn digit 0 followed by digit 1 followed by digit 2 in this kind of a continual manner i see that after all neurons have picked up zeros there is no way for it to learn one without going through overwriting of information or over learning of information. And by the time it learns digit two, it has completely messed up what it has learned. So that the like, you know, the, and the network is completely rendered useless at this point of time. But if I can, so this is this problem is called catastrophic forgetting. Some of you who are aware of continual learning would be aware of this term called catastrophe forgetting. But what we find is that with adaptive synaptic plasticity, our network learns in a very interesting way. That means it keeps on forgetting or reorganizing its resources to learn new information. So when, uh, as let's say in this case, it has learned digit zeros first, then it forgets some of the zeros to learn the new information one. And then when digit two comes, because zero was the older one and the one is the most recent information it has learned, it will forget zeros and uh, 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 and to learn the tools and keep ones intact so this is what we were able to do with our control forgetting or learning to forget mechanism with adaptive synaptic plasticity and this is again using an unsupervised local learning rule the same two layer shallow network with excitatory neurons lateral inhibition homeostasis that i talked about right so there is there are some interesting properties of spike timing dependent plasticity as i said in terms of lifelong learning but we cannot really extend it to large tasks like imagenet doing the imagenet recognition or segmentation etc so to that effect then we were like you know let's now move into conversion and again uh, one of the original works of conversion uh, was shown in 2015 uh, but later on in 2017 and 2018, um, there were some more interesting conversion works came up that kind of showed the scalability or like, you know, you can use this conversion technique in order to deploy SNNs of any size. That means you can take any ANN and convert it to an SNN. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about one of the most widely used conversion techniques, which is called threshold balancing. But before we do that, I just want to kind of take a one minute uh, pause here and ask if there are any questions, uh, anything uh, that we have talked so far. Um, any questions here? Okay, so if there are and then maybe we can uh, proceed. Um, so yeah, as I said, like, oh, there is one question. 
Okay, Shail, uh, Dave has asked this question. Threshold in STDP is same for all neurons when we increase. Yes, uh, the threshold is always the same. Yes, uh, we thresh across all neurons in the excitatory layer is always the same. That's a good question. And thank you for asking that. Yes. Any other questions? Okay, uh, maybe then we can... Um, uh, continue or resume. Uh, so as I said, like we look into conversion. So the main idea with, oh, sorry, uh, Aisha Siddiqui has also asked a question. If the neuron forgets the past information, then will it not affect the learning? Yes, it will. It will affect the learning. So uh, let me go back here and show you that in this case, if it is, if it is forgetting the past information, then that means that the idea is that that past information is not relevant for your final task that you are looking at, right? Because think about it this way, that you have deployed this network on some real-time environment. And in this real-time environment, it is it keeps on getting flooded with new data, new data, new data. Now, the idea is that for the neuron to understand what is the data that I need to retain versus what is the data that I can forget, right? In this case, the neuron decided that zero was probably something that I can forget and I need to retain more newer information. And that's the context in which I applied the control forgetting. But let's say maybe your, um, uh, your problem set statement is a little bit flipped. That means whatever information comes early, that is the most relevant one. And whatever information comes later is the like you know it's not relevant it's the insignificant one so here the control forgetting will make sure that zeros are always written one is always written and two may not even it may not even pick up two probably you know it will retain all the zeros and probably pick up one one two here right so you can actually control the environment of forgetting in a way in which your problem asks you to i hope that answers the question aisha but yes definitely it will affect the uh, learning how can we in, uh, in, in implement the leaky and integrate concept of LIF layer in hardware? Yes, it is an RC circuit. Uh, in hardware, the leaky and integrate fu um, uh, function will be a simple RC circuit, right? Um, but you can also think about it using an adder and then having a constant leak. So what we do also is like, you know, if you don't use a RC circuit or something, if you are using a more digital module rather than an analog module, uh, then you want to kind of have this because the integrate function is nothing but an accumulating function, right? So an adder function. And then you will also have a, a, a little bit of a subtracting amount, which is the leak function. So you can implement it using this accumulator subtractor circuitry in digital or a RC circuit in an analog manner. I uh, hope that answers the question, Aisha. Okay, great. Um, if there are no more questions, then I will move ahead. Uh, as I said, so with conversion, uh, the idea is that you take a trained ANN and then convert it into an SNN, okay? So scaling up to large tasks that was not possible with STDP is now possible, okay? And of course, we maintain the energy efficiency because we are still doing event-driven processing. Uh, the good thing is that the burden of training is done. We really don't have to think about how to go around this thresholding functionality and all of that. We can definitely use existing frameworks like PyTorch, TensorFlow, because we already know these frameworks are already available for ANN training. And we are definitely taking that trained ANN and then doing something in order to convert it into an SNN. So what is the goal with conversion? Given the trained weights of an ANN, we need to convert the ReLU neuron to an integrate fire neuron, okay? So in this case, uh, there has been some recent works that also do conversion from ReLU to leaky integrate fire, but I'm gonna be talking about that um, uh, original work that did this transfer from ReLU to integrate fire and scaled it up to ImageNet-like tasks, okay? But essentially, what do you mean by integrate fire neuron? Integrate fire neuron means that the leak value is uh, one, right? So instead of having some kind of a leak value, which is less than one, which you will always multiply with your previous uh, time steps membrane potential, now you will have a leak value which is equal to one, right? Um, so if you see here that the idea is that we want to replace ReLU with an integrate fire neuron and all it comes down to is statistical matching. So it's very simple. So if you see here that this is the ReLU neuron, 
right y is equal to max of zero say, su summation of the uh, wx and an integrate fire spiking neuron looks like this that means the membrane potential at time step t plus one is dependent upon the membrane potential at time step t so here this value is one if there was a 0 0.99 0 0.98 or something that means there is a leak of 0 0.99 that means at every time step that it leaks by 10 percent if it is 0 0.99 if it, it uh, sorry one percent or if it is 0 0.98 it leaks by two percent etc and then, of course, it takes the summation um, operation, which is the W multiplied by the spikes coming in XT. Now, if input X is 0.5, then the expected value of X over all time steps, that means when you average the total number of spikes divided by the total number of time steps, that should be equal to 0.5. And that's what rate coding is able to give you. This statistical transfer is achieved by with rate coding because that's what you do. Now, the question is that let's say you have a neuron here, which is a ReLU neuron. It gets so your X gets multiplied with a weight of 0.5. Your ReLU output is 0.25 here. Then the idea is that with your membrane potential integrate fire spiking neuron uh, functionality, if you have the same weight, because the weight will get transferred right from a trained ANN to this converted SNN, the weight will be the right. All you need to make sure you do is that the expected value of the output, that means the total number of spikes that you produce divided by the total number of time steps, right, that you process it for should be also equal to 0.25, okay? This is what you need to do. Now, how do we make sure we do that? Now, it so happens that if you think, if you look at the ReLU function, y is a function of x, then this y as a function of x, if you just plot it, the slope of this line is going to be equal to w because y will be equal to wx, right? In this, when uh, when this is greater than zero, so the slope of this line is the uh, w. And if you think about having an equivalent statistical transfer between ReLU and integrate fire neuron, so if you look at expected value of y versus expected value of x, and you see the slope of this line. The slope of this line not only depends upon W, but it also depends upon VTH. That means depending upon how you set the threshold value of the neuron, you will produce that many number of spikes or that many less number of spikes. So the answer of balancing or matching ReLU to the spiking neuron or transferring ReLU to the integrate fire neuron lies in balancing VTH. So if you find the appropriate value of VTH when you're doing the conversion, you will be equivalently able to convert the ANN into an SNN without any loss. That's the basic idea. And how do we make sure we select the right threshold? And this work was, uh, uh, this work used this technique called threshold balancing. So the idea is that for every time step, right, for depending upon how the inputs come in, let's say I'm just showing you an illustrative example. For every time step, I just measure the membrane potential here. And my threshold is set as the membrane potential that reaches the highest value at a given time step. So I take the max of the membrane potential that I observe at every time step across all T. Okay. And why, what is the heuristic reason or the intuition behind using this kind of a metric for setting the threshold? Because we know that maximum input will definitely cause a neuronal firing at that time step. Uh, and anything in between, we never know. If, we, if, if I set the VTH to be here or VTH to be here, let's say, right, then I don't know whether my new neuronal input will fire or not, right, if I set this kind of a threshold. And also, I am always um, um, making my network more vulnerable to learning more, like, you know, to learning uh, uh, very less information if I set a very high VTH. And if I set a very low VTH like this or this, uh, it means that you know every neuron can have this uh, spiking capability for all the inputs coming in. That means there'll be no information selectivity. So by setting my threshold corresponding to the neuron which has the maximum membrane potential and setting the threshold value equal to that maximum membrane potential that you reach at a given time step, that's how you're able to kind of do this equivalent transfer, okay? So now coming to the results, which kind of are very, so it's a very simple technique. That means for every layer, you just, so let's say you have corn layer one, you pass rate coded inputs, look at the membrane potential across all time steps, then set the threshold of that layer corresponding to the maximum membrane potential you reach. And then now you go to corn layer two. So then now that you have set the threshold of the first layer, you know the spiking activity that will be coming from the first layer now. And that spike, new spiking activity is sent to the second layer and then you again set the threshold. So you layer-wise set the threshold in this kind of a converted uh, spiking neural network. 
and we find out that interestingly enough with this conversion mechanism we can deploy 16 layered vgg networks or 20 layered resnet networks and the kind of error rate that you get is pretty much like negligible when it when you uh, think in comparison to an ann so we get we see that like you know as compared to an ann or an sn uh, as compared to an ann SNN see, uh, uh, reaches like, you know, um, state of the art accuracy or error values on uh, data sets like CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100, ImageNet, etc. And if you see some interesting um, um, spike activity trend, you see that the total number of spikes per neuron, whether it's for a VGG network or a ResNet network, the total number of spikes reduces as you go deeper into the network. That means the earlier networks have a larger spike activity and the deeper networks have a very small spike activity. And that sparsity actually increases with depth and that actually leads to some interesting energy benefits. So we find out that, you know, the 16x reduction in reduced activity or 13x reduction in reduced activity for VGG or ResNet translates to energy reduction when you put it on actual hardware estimation energy estimation tools right because now not so, so in, in an ann it won't be like it won't be like only one percent of the neurons in that layer are active it will be all neurons are active right but in an snn actually the sparsity really really plays a huge role in terms of lending energy efficiency now the main problem here is that for you to get this low accuracy loss conversion from an ANN to an SNN, you really need very large number of time steps. That means for you to statistically match the ReLU function to the integrate fire function, you really have to process the data over thousands of time steps in order to get an a accuracy or a, or a lossless conversion basically or a, you know you should not incur any performance loss when you do the conversion now that is not really advantageous because the amount of energy efficiency that you're expecting kind of reduces right because when you actually put it on hardware the latency of processing is going to really really and the communication related energy all of that is going to overpower all your benefits so the question was that can we come up with a better way of reducing the number of time steps and to that effect people started coming up with this back propagation based spiking neural networks and i'll go into that next uh, there is one question here uh, chen liu has asked are these works based on rate coding yes yes everything is based on rate coding here uh, chen uh, whatever i'm going to be talking about today is all based on rate coding um, there has not been very like i think very recently I saw like two weeks ago I saw work on temporal coding uh, but that also showed some results on MNIST not even CIFAR 10 so it's still not very mature enough the temporal coding based works uh, at least uh, as far as uh, to the best of my understanding. Any further questions? Uh, Aisha Siddiqui has asked low BTH can also increase the energy consumption. Absolutely yes because you are spiking a lot that's the reason why you need to balance uh, the VTH. So you need to, uh, uh, that's why we don't set it to a very low VTH regime or a very high VTH regime. We set it to the VTH regime wherein you will have that equivalent statistical transfer that ReLU activity and the integrate fire activity should match. But then the question is that, is that good enough, right? Uh, it, will that be sparse enough is the question. Uh, and of course, it, not only VTH, but as I said, the number of time steps of processing is very large. You're processing on the order of 2000, 2500 time steps to get this kind of a very high performance, right? And that's not feasible when you put it on hardware. So we really have to think about how to reduce the number of uh, time steps as well as come up with a better way of implementing things. Ajay has asked how VTH can be implemented in digital or FPGA. Well, the V threshold is essentially a comparator, right? Uh, so let's say in a digital implementation or FPGA implementation, when you're implementing this leaky integrate fire neuron, as I said, you have an adder circuitry, right? Or an accumulator actually, because you have to also accumulate the value from the previous time step on, onto the uh, current time step. So you have an accumulator and when you always have this kind of a comparator circuitry that will take the output of the accumulator and compare it with the threshold vth right and vth is something like you know you can use it uh, you you can be, uh, and the uh, uh, comparator can be like you know you can use some vth as a reference voltage or something yeah but i hope you uh, uh, get the idea about like you know how vth uh, basically the comparator will have some vref right and that vref will be encoded to the appropriate vth value um, the question that might come out from here is that, you know, now that you have this layer wise threshold, that means for every layer, 
right? Uh, each and every layer's neuronal unit will have a different threshold. So do we need to save these thresholds somewhere in our main memory and then fetch it when we are doing neuronal processing? Yes. So all the VTHs have to be saved somewhere so that when you're doing the actual processing of the SN and you will fetch all the uh, VTH values and then program your comparators to that V reference for that VTH for that layer and then do the forward processing. So uh, there is going to be a little bit of overhead in terms of even fetching the VTH values and storing the VTH values. But it's going to be not large enough because e all layers have the same VTH. So if it's a 16 layer network, the I you're only storing 16 VTH values. It's not going to be extremely uh, a large overhead when you're storing all these weights and parameters, et cetera. I hope that answers the question, Ajay. Uh, Aisha has asked, is VTH uh, different uh, for different layers? Why not the same? Aisha, because in the conversion network, we do layer-wise thresholding. That means what happens is first, you will show the rate-coded input to the first con layer, figure out its threshold. Once you've figured out its threshold, now when you pass this rate-coded input to the first con layer, that will also produce some spike activity. You take those spiking activity, now you set the threshold of the next layer of the con uh, of con two let's say from that ann similarly you go on and go so and uh, go on uh, uh, like that now why can't we have the same vtage because as i said we have to match the relu activity to the integrate fire activity by you never for all the layers the relu activation has a variation right so similarly your integrate fire activity will also have a variation so you need to have different vtage at least in this conversion network because you are not training the network from scratch here. You are rather training the network from an ANN, you're taking its statistics and those variable statistics have to be matched uh, even in the SNN. And that's why you have a variable VTH. But as we will see in the back propagation with SNN, we'll actually have set the VTH all same and we'll train the network using the same VTH. So that means with back propagation, once you have set all these hyperparameters related to VTH, weight initialization, et cetera, et cetera, let the network figure out based on that common VTH, it will automatically figure out how my weight should be trained such that my accuracy goes up. Okay, I hope that answers the question, Aisha. Okay, great. So let's move on to the next, uh, which is coming, kind of going to be our uh, long haul discussion on uh, back propagation with spiking neural networks. Okay, so as I said, with spike based back propagation, uh, the what was the main motivation here that we really want to reduce the latency I mean you know from thousands we at least want to come to the order of hundreds right even lesser than that if possible right um, and how and and the idea is that like you know we want to do from scratch training that means the backward propagation the gradients error gradient calculation that you need to do for each and every layer of the network so that you can do weight updates all that has to be done using spike statistics okay so we have to do end to end back propagation using spikes okay and what we will see is that because we are doing spike based training actually uh, uh, the spike based back propagation train networks have even sparser spiking activity than a converted snn because as i said in converted snn the spiking behavior is not under our control right we are taking a trained ann and just making sure that the spiking behavior matches to that of the activity of the ANS so that we get this um, accurate and uh, no accuracy loss network, right? But when we are training the network from scratch and letting the network itself figure out that how the weight should be for the given set of threshold parameters, et cetera, it actually leads to spike as sparser spiking activity. And that can be, again, that will be very energy efficient as we will see. Okay, so learning with spike-based backpropagation, if you see like what we are trying to do when we are doing spike-based backpropagation, now this here is a standard forward-backward pipeline. For any network, you will have some forward where you will calculate the intermediate layer activations and calculate the final error or loss. And then based on that error or loss, you will do a backward propagation to calculate the error gradients, right? And that, that will be used to calculate the weight updates. Now, when you look at the chain rule, when you uh, decompose this error gradient through chain rule, you see there's a function f dash that is very, very important and that will be used. This f dash function is used for updating of all weights. Now, what is f dash? f dash is nothing but the differentiation of the neuronal activation. 
So if your neuronal activation is continuous, F dash will be differentiable or F dashes exists. So for a ReLU derivative, F dash exists because del y del x will be equal to one in the greater than zero regime, right? In the, when x is greater than zero regime, uh, then this uh, ReLU derivative is equal to one, right? Whereas for a leaky integrator and fire function, the thresholding functionality, right, creates this uh, function or makes this F function non-differentiable, right? So because the there is a VMEM greater than VTH functionality that will determine whether you produce a spike or not. So the thresholding functionality uh, is there for which the derivative is not defined. Now the idea for us with when we are doing spike-based back propagation, and you would have seen a lot of works that have come up for spike-based back propagation. What all of these works are trying to do is to approximate the LIF neuron, right? With some kind of a F approx function for which your gradients can be calculated. So you take this discontinuous LIF function and you kind of during back propagation. So during forward propagation, you use F, but during back propagation, you instead use F approx to calculate this F dash. Okay. And this F approx is a continuous variant of this leak integrate fire function. Okay. And that's all there is to it. So this is how you will do gradient based back propagation. And since we are, sorry, uh, since we are replacing the actual gradients for F with surrogate gradients using F approx. So generally the word surrogate gradient based back propagation is what is used to define spike based back propagation training. Okay, so we'll do surrogate gradient based back propagation. So from now onwards, when I say surrogate gradient based back propagation, it's essentially the spike based back propagation training. <clears throat> Okay, so here, what we have is that again, we have the Poiso spike train going into the leaky integrate and fire neuron. I have just written it in these time step uh, manner here, as you, as you can see here, but the idea is the same. You have the membrane potential from time step T minus one that is being used to update the membrane potential from time step T. And of course it is being updated based on the incoming input spikes coming from time step T again, right? And that will produce this output spike, let's say, and of course, we are using this U, if U, a membrane potential is greater than threshold, it will produce an output spike. So this is how forward propagation is. Now, when you do back propagation, what we do actually, like think about it this way, that you would have heard about computational graphs in PyTorch and TensorFlow frameworks, right? So what happens when you're doing back propagation is that the network gets unrolled in time. So at t equal to one, at t equal to one, you see that this both the inputs x1 and x2 had a spike, but there was no output spike at t equal to one. And similarly, at t equal to two, x1 had a spike, x2 did not have a spike, and again, output did not have a spike. And at t equal to three, this was how the uh, timestamp of the network looked like from an input and an output spike. So you unroll the network in time. You look at the timestamps of the network from the input and the output spike at different time steps. And then what you do during back propagation is that you calculate this do by dx quantity, which is essentially that function f quantity, right? Uh, in order to calculate your weight updates, you, you need to calculate do by dx at every time step, okay? So by chain rule, what happens is that this quantity here kind of you know comes out to be w multiplied by this quantity. And I'm not going into the details of the equation, uh, but the idea is that d, do by du is essentially that you know, non-differentiable quantity. So because it's a thresholding functionality, DO by DU will be a Dirac delta function. And you cannot have a Dirac delta function, of course, because it is undefined. So what we do is we approximate. And the approximation that I use, I can use a linear approximation, I can use an exponential approximation, etc. So without going into the details, what we are doing is that wherever this non-differentiability appears, I'm going to approximate it with a linear or a pass through gradient. So, you know, you guys would have heard about binary neural networks where they are doing straight through estimation when they are doing back propagation, because when they're they are doing forward propagation, they are kind of doing a thresholding functionality or a sign functionality to produce a plus one or a minus one in a binary network, right? So they do straight through gradient pass. That means even if it encounters this non-linearity, the gradient from the previous layer will pass as it is. 
through to the uh, 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 gradient from layer L plus one will pass to layer L as it is. So this is called straight through estimation, but we can kind of add it up with some or multiply with some scaling factors using exponential or linear relationships and kind of get some much better behavior. Because with surrogate gradient, as I said, the idea is that to approximate the real gradient, which is non-differentiable and not uh, cannot be calculated with as close as possible with a surrogate gradient that will allow you to do this time step based back propagation. So with the approximation, you will do some uh, pre computation of possible gradient values. Um, and that actually allows you to do this kind of a gradient based back propagation processing. Now, something to notice here is that when you're doing gradient based back propagation processing in an SNN, we are actually processing the SNN. If you think from a software point of view, okay, for a software designer, this SNN is actually being repeatedly loaded for every time step. And the, when you think from a computational graph processing behavior, that means for every time step, I need to create a copy and then I have to do the back propagation from the last time step till the current time step, right? So this is going to be very slow because it's going to be, I meaning because for 2000 time steps or if you, even for 100 time steps, if you are creating copies of the same network, it's going to be very memory expensive to train on the GPUs, okay? Uh, or using frameworks. But the, the good thing is that because of the fact that we know that these GPUs and these recurrent, uh, these frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow can actually train recurrent network, which also use the same philosophy of this kind of, you know, using copies of the same graph to do the processing. So we know that the SN, the, uh, uh, the GPUs and the PyTorch kind of like frameworks can take an SNN and train it using the surrogate gradient mechanism, but it's going to be slow. So the training is going to be very inefficient. Uh, and that's where you have to think of whether neuromorphic hardware that are being proposed, True North or Loihi, Loihi 2, which has come up very recently, I'll talk about it towards the end, uh, will that be useful, okay? But in this case, like going forward, I want all of you to like kind of little bit close your eyes towards the training inefficiency. But what we will say is that we are now able to train a network using spike-based statistics what are the advantages we are getting during inference, okay? And can we do more with this kind of spike-based statistics is the question, okay? So with spy, uh, with surrogate back propagation, uh, the results, as I said, like, you know, we were able to reduce the number of time steps, right? So we were able to like, with the S ANN and SNN converted network, the best accuracy we got after thousand time steps, but here we are able to get the best accuracy with just hundreds of time steps, okay? So uh, we found out like, you know, different kinds of speed up and I'm gonna quickly go over the results because I want to talk to you about other mechanisms. Uh, but the idea is that now we were able to train deeper SNNs, you know, VGG9, Res ResNet 9, 11, ResNet 11 like networks. And of course, the energy efficiency is much greater than even a converted SNN. That's what you see here, right? For example, if you just consider a VGG9 network, the converted SNN has 28x improvement as compared to ANN, whereas um, uh, the uh, the um, uh, sorry, um, I'm, I'm sorry. So the, uh, the converted SNN has 1.13x improvement in terms of efficiency as compared to ANN, whereas in case of the SNN, uh, the efficiency is 8x. So like, you know, the, the SNN has more efficiency because as we see here, in terms of the spike activity, the SNN, the, the spike based, the surrogate gradient trained SNN has much lesser spiking activity as compared to the ANN SNN converted network. Okay, and that basically that spike activity reduction uh, really, really leads to kind of this energy efficiency benefits. That's what is the main benefactor here. Okay, um, now as is, oh, sorry, there's a repetition. Uh, sorry, so then, but so the, the main key takeaway that I wanted to uh, 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 project here is that we are using leaky integrate and fire neuron. There is temporal dependency that is intact during the training that allows us to do low latency. Like, you know, now we are even doing inference at 100 time steps. Of course, the training, as I said, let's close our eyes to training. You have trained the network. All you need to think about is what is the advantages we are doing in inference. So number of processing time steps from conversion has reduced by 10x because conversion was using 1000, now it is using 100. But still there is a problem that you cannot really scale to very deep architectures. Okay, so with back propagation and spiking networks, what people found out is that we can train it with less time steps, right? But still, uh, we really cannot, um, you know, and the training time was of course higher, training energy was also higher. 
but can we actually reduce the time steps further was the question so what there was when an interesting work uh, that came up in the year 2020 last year uh, and which talked about can we use a hybrid way of training things that means you first take a converted network then you take that converted network and then you again train it with surrogate gradient back propagation so that was actually able to get very large uh, um, uh, you know uh, that was able to actually get interesting uh, latency results and was also able to give good results in terms of scaling up for larger tasks so with surrogate gradient when this was initially proposed we could not scale it up to even beyond cfa 10 tasks like you know cfa 10 was the best data set we could work with but with the conversion plus the back propagation this hybrid training we were now able to deploy uh, snn for imagenet or cfa 100 or tiny imagenet uh, but with uh, uh, time steps which is slightly more than 100 so because it is an in between kind of a thing right so it will be lesser than conversion and slightly greater than uh, just doing surrogate backdrop okay so we have fast uh, we also got faster training more efficient inference but the con was that we are really really not training from scratch here we are still relying on a converted network and then training the network or fine tuning the network with some spike based back propagation right so just showing some interesting results from a hybrid training perspective that we are doing so let's say that first you take an ann right which gives you like i'm just going to follow the uh, cfar 10 graph here so and uh, let's just follow the resnet graph okay so initially the ann of a resnet 20 network gives you 93.15 percent accuracy when you convert the network it goes to 92.94 but you really need to convert it at 2500 time steps if you convert it at lesser time steps like 250 or 100 right the number of the accuracy kind of reduces quite significantly with an cfar 10 the accuracy loss is less but with a image net like network the accuracy loss is more than five percent or six percent right which is not something that you can afford then what people did was that they kind of converted it at less time steps but they to in order to recover the loss in accuracy they fine-tuned the network with spike based training at this lesser number of time steps right and now that you have lesser number of time steps you can afford to do the fine tuning uh, with the increased training uh, complexity of course because you have to do that computational graph and copy all the time but still it is doable rather than uh, doing a network training for 2500 time steps right and that was able to recover some of the accuracy uh, uh, loss so the idea is very simple this is a very simple thing you take a converted network you uh, convert it at lesser number of time steps and whatever accuracy loss you incur you recover it back using some fine tuning but this is spike based fine tuning and we were able to get some interesting state of the art results and this was one of our recent papers in uh, from uh, 2020 now based on that there have been some other works right there are other approaches that like you know again like you know the idea is that what are we trying to reduce here number of time steps right so low latency is going to be one of the key motivations right but at the same time we want to see that you know can you actually look at lower the energy of uh, energy can you make things much more faster in terms of training etc so people started thinking about why should we train with spike inputs uh, um, people started thinking about and this was a work that was again uh, published in 2020 um, uh, this was this came from a group at Purdue but the, the idea was that you know instead of training with spikes with a rate encoded inputs we will feed direct RGB inputs to the first convolutional layer and from the co convolutional layer we will attach an LIF neuron that converts these float inputs from the first convolutional layer to spikes and then we will train the rest of the network which has these spiking neurons with surrogate gradient descent okay so they were able to show low latency uh, inform uh, yeah, like inference but still because of the fact that the first layer was rgb and it was all being processed in an ann like manner the amount of energy was high and also we found out that the robustness of these networks was very low and i'll talk about robustness in the later slides now there is another thing that also kind of we did in terms of hybridization that means do you really need to when you're training very deep networks can we have a partly artificial and a partly spiking neural architecture right that will improve the uh, accuracy even more so the idea was that instead of training an snn from scratch across all layers you will have some ann blocks you'll have some snn blocks and then you will do the training now can you do and, and will that help well we, we found out that yes it helped in terms of lowering the latency but of course there are the, the energy was higher because of the fact 
that you are using ANN blocks, right? You are using ANN blocks, and those those ANN blocks will in, uh, will incur higher energy. So then uh, we ask this question that can we do further better? Okay. So what we proposed was that we wanted to see that you know so far in SNN training, people have not used batch normalization. Okay, and batch normalization, as we know, that it is one of the key enablers of fast training of spike of artificial neural networks. So we wanted to see how to incorporate batch normalization in order to accelerate the training of spiking neural networks using surrogate gradient. And we wanted to see that if that gives you some interesting other benefits. So the idea is that with batch normal, we propose this algorithm called batch normalization through time that allowed us to uh, integrate temporal characteristics in some very interesting ways. Okay, it decouples the parameters in the batch norm layer, and I'll show you uh, how it does. Uh, but the idea is that we were able to, like, the main contribution was that now we were able to train SNNs from scratch with just twenty-five to thirty times steps of latency. <coughs> And at the same time, we were able to come up with this some interesting algorithm called temporal early exit that allowed us to do even better inference latency. Uh, there are some questions here. Um, oh, there are no more questions, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> So with batch normalization through time, as I said, like, you know, um, we are trying to incorporate batch normalization in a spiking neural network, just to give you a refresher as to what batch normalization does. What does batch normalization do? It, when you pass a batch of inputs, it calculates the mean and variance for that batch of inputs. And then it transforms the input in this way, right? And on top of that, in after your convolutional layer or your fully connected layer, layer, you will have a batch norm layer, right? And what does batch norm layer do? It batch norm layer has these attached parameters called gamma and beta that actually improve the representation capability of the layer. So the learnable parameter gamma and beta are learned during the training process of this ANN and they help you to train better, okay? That's the basic idea of a batch norm in an ANN. Now we will see how we can include that in an SNN. <coughs> so with batch normalization in SNNs, now I'm gonna um, uh, go quickly over this slide, but the idea was that if we attach a single batch norm parameter across all time steps of inputs coming in, it is not going to be a very effective way of doing batch normalization. Why? Because we see that the activity of a network across all time steps is very different. So that means if you just plot the mean of the signal across all time steps based on the type of input coming in, you see that the mean of the signal is itself different. So if you attach just one batch norm parameter to, to understand all the activity across all time steps, that's not going to be able to capture that activity, right? So what we find is that if you just at standard in a very standard way, if you just attach a batch norm parameter in front of a convolutional layer before a LIF layer, the accuracy of the network actually degrades as compared to an ANN accuracy. But with batch normalization through time, wherein we will, we will say what is the main uh, idea of batch normalization through time. That means what every time step we are attaching a batch norm parameter with it. Okay. So that actually is able to give us very good performance in terms of accuracy and the latency is now 25 to 50 time steps. So from earlier surrogate gradient learning, which was hundred time steps. Now with batch normalization through time, we are able to reduce it to 25 to 50 time steps. So this was actually one, this is one of the state of the art works in terms of surrogate gradient from scratch training that allows you to train spiking neural networks at such low latency. Okay, so the idea with BNTT is that we vary the internal parameters in a batch norm layer through time. Okay, and uh, uh, as I said, like, you know, in your standard LIF neuron, you have membrane potential being uh, uh, controlled in this way. Now with a batch normalization through time uh, neuron, or with a batch normalization through time uh, kind of a layer, what you have is that you will attach this batch norm parameter after your weighted summation function. That means after you pro probably do convolution or a linear function based on fully connected operation, you will attach this batch norm layer. And if you see the batch norm here, here there is a gamma that is being attached to every time step. That means 
for a corresponding time step of input there is a new gamma that is always being learned okay so from a architecture perspective how does it look that here also it is similar to what an ann has in terms of batch norm a batch norm here is between a con when a relu here the bntt layer is between a con when a lia okay and now with every xt there will be a new gamma t that is being learned here there is only x coming in so there is only one gamma but here with every xt there is a new gamma t that is being learned now what does that mean is that like you know for every batch of inputs coming in as you can see here for gamma for time step 0 gamma 0 is the learnable parameter for time step 1 gamma 1 is the learnable parameter and so on and so forth right and what we find is that by varying the internal parameters of the batch norm layer through time we can actually get some very good results okay so first let me tell you what does batch normalization through time do when we measured the spiking activity of different layers of this vgg9 network that was trained with cfa10 when we looked at the spiking activity of the converted network the surrogate gradient descent network which we used in the previous uh, which i talked earlier and the bntt based network you see that in conversion and surrogate gradient descent initially there is very low activity and then it goes to some high activity and saturates there right that's what was the layer spike activity of previous methods but with bntt we got a very interesting trend like this gaussian like trend that means there is a rise in activity and then a fall in activity rise in activity and a fall in activity so we wanted to investigate like why is this happening right like what is like because conversion and surrogate gradient descent are showing this like you know it goes up and then stays so that means that once the network reaches some saturating activity behavior it just continues to uh, 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 you know spike at that rate but here every layer is spiking at a very different rate and it increases uh, uh, um, it increases and then decreases also for certain layers right so we wanted to investigate this behavior more and this behavior was actually captured because of the gamma parameter or the learnable batch norm parameter okay we found out actually that when we visualized how gamma is being learned at different layers of the network over time we found out that gamma learns temporal importance of each layer so what we did was we take a trained network we have trained it using batch normalization through time and now for different layers of the network we are capturing what is the final gamma value that is learned at every time step so for gamma 1 what is the value of gamma 1 at time step 1 gamma 2 at time step 1 uh, time step 2 gamma 3 at time step 3 and so on and we are doing it for every layer okay because there will be every layer has its own gamma value right what we see is that the maximum gamma shifts okay uh, so what we see is that like the maximum gamma for con layer 1 occurs at time step 1 for con layer 2 the maximum gamma value occurs at time step 5 and so on and so forth so the maximum gamma shifts to later time steps for deeper layers right and what is this gamma value mean like if the gamma is high if the gamma value is high then this output will be high as a result if this output is high the membrane potential will go to a higher value that is what we mean right so um uh, if the gamma value is high your membrane potential will reach a higher value and there will be more spike activity or that is what that it means and if the gamma value is low then the membrane potential will be low and there will be no spike activity right so what this means is that the spike information is propagating in this manner that means the first layer will spike first and the later layers will spike later and this is pretty much intuitive right it's not like every layer should spike at all times which is what we see previously in previous methods you see that after certain time steps every layer is having a kind of a similar spike rate right but here we are able to see that no that's not the case actually all layers spike at different time steps and early layers spike early and later layers spike later now this thing can actually while it is very intuitive but it was not captured with previous methods which now batch normalization through time is able to capture and the other thing that we were able to take advantage of using batch normalization through time is temporal early exit now if you see after this now after time step 20 you see the the uh, gamma parameters for all layers is very very low right which is shade which is uh, shown in this black shaded regime right so if low gamma means as i said low spike activity me the uh, low spike activity that means the network at the later time steps is not spiking enough to give you any relevant information 
So what we decided was that maybe this means that by after inference, if we just monitor the gamma, we can actually stop the inference at a very early time step, right? So even though we trained the network for 25 time steps, we don't need to do inference for 25 time steps. We can stop the inference at, let's say in this case, the 20th time step. So I'm going to give you some uh, experimental results that we got, and we will do a comparison at every time between conversion, surrogate gradient, as well as the hybrid training. That means conversion plus surrogate gradient. Okay. So for CIFAR 10, as you see here, ANN, SNN conversion results for a 16 layer network, the latency is very high, right? But the accuracy is also good. Okay. But with and the surrogate gradient learning, the latency was low, accuracy was reasonable, right? But as we will find out that standard surrogate gradient, you cannot really scale it up to larger data sets like CIFAR 100 or tiny ImageNet, okay? And that's why this hybrid training was proposed, right? Because we could not scale it up to larger data sets. And as you can see, the, uh, the for hybrid training, the uh, uh, latency is somewhere in between like 200 time steps and the accuracy is still reasonable. But with BNTT, we are able to reduce the latency seriously by orders of magnitude. Right now, it's just like, you know, almost a one tenth of what it was for hybrid training. And remember, we are doing all this thing from scratch. There is no conversion or anything. You allow the BNTT network to train from scratch with rate coded inputs. And we are able to maintain the accuracy up to 90%, right? And as I said, we can do early exit. So even though we do the training for 25 time steps, we can actually infer at 20 time steps and still not observe a high accuracy loss. We see similar results for again CIFAR 100. I'm going to skip this slide. Um, uh, but uh, the idea is that with BNTT, we are able to kind of get the best results. And as I and you, there is one thing missing here, as you can see, the surrogate gradient de uh, descent based uh, model, because that was that cannot be trained on such complex data sets. So we really have to use BNTT or some other kind of a learning rule in order to do it. But BNTT was able to kind of accelerate the training and um, give you more vi uh, 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 wider uh, applications. Now, similarly, we also expanded it to tiny ImageNet, and this shows the power of BNTT, right, for enabling training on non-trivial, very complex data sets like tiny ImageNet. And as compared to a converted network, we are really using one hundredth of the number of time steps, okay, and we are getting even better accuracy than a converted network. So this again tells you that actually, like so far, we were really not utilizing time step based uh, training very well. And by using just simple batch normalization, we are able to accelerate the training. I'm going to skip this slide because we are kind of running. Uh, we have like right now another 25 minutes to wrap up. So I uh, just wanted to go over some energy efficiency comparison. Uh, the energy efficiency comparison, as I said, like we are comparing BNTT with surrogate gradient descent and conversion. We find that in comparison to surrogate gradient descent, even if it uses the same number of time steps, right? Uh, we wanted to do a fair comparison. Conversion, of course, you know, we cannot do less number of time steps because we will have a huge accuracy loss. So uh, we com uh, compared with the conversion uh, at 91% accuracy for like, you know, so ISO accuracy, but reasonable number of time steps comparison. That's what we wanted to compare. If you see here that converted networks are uh, have a spike rate of more than 10 um, spikes, uh, con uh, surrogate gradient networks have a spike rate of less than 10 spikes, but BNTT on an average have less than uh, uh, one. So this is a logarithmic time scale. That means uh, with the help of BNTT, we are able to reduce the number of spikes. That means on an average, we will have 10% spike activity. So on an average, in the entire network, 90% of the neurons will be inactive and only 10% of the neurons is active. And that is actually going to give you very high energy efficiency. As you can see here, that with conversion, if you actually see that in comparison to the, uh, if you increase the number of time steps, uh, then in some cases, you are not even getting any efficiency improvement as compared to an ANN. Because as the number of time steps increases, the latency increases. So whatever efficiency you expect with respect to um, uh, uh, SNN is not there anymore because you are really, really consuming a lot of energy in just doing this uh, more time step processing. But with um, surrogate gradient descent, you still are like getting a very less benefits, like 5.05x, which is like 5% improvement. But with uh, BNTT, we are able to get 9x improvement. And that is because of the overall reduction in spike activity, as well as the reduction in 
time steps. So BNTD has this very good double effect, right? Double advantage effect, which is like reduction in spike activity as well as reduction in time steps that gives you interesting energy results. Okay, so the key takeaway is that with BNTD, we are able to train low latency networks, very highly uh, energy efficient. And for the first time, we are able to train networks on non-trivial data sets from scratch, okay, without relying on conversion or anything. Okay, uh, there is a question here. Uh, can we use BNTT SNN for neuromorphic data set like neuromorphic MNIST? Yes, uh, sorry, Aisha, I skipped that slide, but I had a slide on um, uh, DVS CIFAR 10. Uh, this was the slide on DVS CIFAR 10, which is actually a neuromorphic data set. And we see that with BNTT, we are able to get state of the art results, like 63.2%, uh, which is uh, almost, uh, which, is, which actually outperforms state of the art uh, than what other uh, neuromorphic data sets had, okay? So we are actually able to get much better results than what other state of the art uh, data sets uh, networks have. Okay, um, so moving on, um, again, as I said, like because BNTT allows us to now explore other things, right? Because we now have a from scratch training rule. So we were thinking like, can we use BNTT for other things like segmentation? Now, this is something that has not been explored in the spiking world before this work, right? So this is the first work that explores segmentation and in, in particularly video segmentation using spiking networks. Okay. And the problem with segmentation, if you use conversion, there is a problem that, you know, there is a lot of variation in spike activity when you look at a, a network that is doing segmentation and an artificial neural network that is doing uh, segmentation. So you really cannot convert without incurring a huge loss of uh, accuracy. Okay, and you really need a lot of time steps, more than like 5,000 time steps even to maintain some reasonable performance, right? So this is not, not really uh, feasible. So what we did was we applied the BNTT from scratch training, okay, for segmentation applications. And if you are familiar with some of these applications, then you know that Deep Lab and Fully Convolutional Network or FCN are sort of the state-of-the-art network architectures that you use for these applications. So we came up with a spiking version of Deep Lab or a spiking version of FCN, but we trained this network from scratch using BNTT. Now, what we found is that now we are able to train the spiking versions of the same architectures using 20 time steps. And in terms of the performance, we are getting like close, right? Like uh, Deep Lab has almost similar performance, but with FCN, FCN still gives you 6% better um, uh, performance in terms of MIOU uh, than spiking FCN. Uh, so ANNs are still showing higher performance than SNNs. And if I increase the number of time steps, I can uh, kind of uh, uh, club this. But my main idea was that, you know, um, uh, for the first time, we can showcase the feasibility of SNNs for such tasks. So this was what we could do. Like with the DVS uh, uh, DDD data set, we could do segmentation like this. And with Pascal VOC data set also, this is a spiking version of the deep lab that I am showing. And this is actually able to give some very good segmentation results. Now, interestingly enough, what we found out is that spiking networks, right? The spiking deep lab or the spiking FCN, as you can see here, are much robust to noisy data. So let's say now I put some Gaussian noise or blurring noise or salt and pepper noise to this data input here or data input here. And if I see my segmentation output result, the accuracy drop that I get in terms of uh, for a deep lab ANN or a FCN ANN is much higher higher as I increase the standard deviation of the noise with respect to the uh, SNN. So the SNN models are much more robust to noise uh, infiltration in an input than an ANN model. So even though the accuracy in general of the SNN is lower, but it's okay because of the fact that the robustness improvements is still observed with uh, ANNs. And this is one of the first of its kind result which showcases the effectiveness of SNNs in doing something more that ANNs are not capable of. And in this case, it is noise-based noise robustness. Okay, now in the last couple of minutes, I want to kind of wrap up by um, uh, talking about some of the other things that we are trying to also uh, do with SNNs. And what we are doing, and this is one of our very recent works that was accepted in Nature Scientific Reports. So we are trying to showcase that, you know, so far we are like, you know, everybody has looking at looking at image classification paths. We look with BNTT, we looked at uh, segmentation also, but we were like, you know, let's start thinking about interpretability for SNNs. 
right i mean in ans there are so many tools visualization tools like grad cams cams um, you know guided backdrop etc etc that tell you that when a network makes a prediction where is the network focusing on now can we have a similar kind of a visual interpretability tool for an snn now that is still like you know all these things that are pretty much established in the ann world are still not explored in the snn world right and the problem is that when we apply gradient grad cam with sn uh, sorry i'm going to skip that slide this is the main slide i want to focus on when the problem of applying grad cam as it is to snn is that with grad cam what we are doing is we take a trained network we have to do a back propagation on that trained network and figure out this heat map at the input okay but the problem is that when we do gradient back propagation in an snn we have to do that surrogate gradient back propagation right and we are always doing some approximation so the gradient approximation will lead to some errors when you are calculating heat maps so if you are so the uh, so the the heat so, so if you use a gradient based method to do visualization it will always give you a inaccurate heat map because your gradients are surrogate gradients that you use right and those that will not be able to give you a correct heat map so what we wanted to do was that can we come up with a spike centric manner of producing a heat map okay now just i'm showing an example here when i applied grad cam in an snn we actually first thing you need to notice is that now the grad cam in an snn will produce the heat map across different time steps which is what we expect that you know for the same input now the input is rate coded across all time steps so the network is looking at different parts of the input at different time steps this is something my grad cam is telling me but it is not enough to say me that you know there is some interesting information that is being captured okay so what we did was that you know can we actually calculate this visualization heat map using interspike interval so that means instead of doing back propagation can we calculate the heat map just looking at the spike activity when you do forward propagation okay so i'm not going to go into the details because of the in the interest of time but the idea is that as you see here that if two neurons are spiking very close to each other that means they are learning something very very interesting and for that neuron if the neuronal spike of that neuron is very close that means it will have a higher contribution score towards visualization than a neuron which is spiking more sparsely okay that's all you you need to remember so the, if the inter spike interval is short for a neuron it will have a higher contribution score and if the interspike interval is less it will have a lower contribution score so with that we were able to get some very interesting visualization and as you see i call it we called it spike activation map and the idea was that now with spike activation map we are actually able to see some interesting visualization results so instead of this noisy visualization you see that in this case this is a goldfish image you see that at different time step again we are getting different visualization for different time steps but we see that the network is actually focusing on some parts of the fish image here right and i'm going to show you some more visualization heat maps so i'm going to do layer wise visualization that means first i'm going to show layer 4 visualization uh, for these images for a lion lemon and a bird and you see across different time steps in the layer 4 the network is actually focusing on some edges and blobs for the lemon it is kind of trying to capture the circle part right for the um, lion it is trying to focus on the nose the eye so it is trying to focus on the edges and the blobs and as you go towards deeper layers and visualize it you see that the network is starting to focus on more shape like or semantic information information as you see from okay so what this tells us is that using just a forward propagation based visualization tool we are able to understand what a spiking neural network is looking at in order to make a prediction now we already know this right shallow layer learn simple patterns deep layers learn more simple uh, semantic information this is an intuition right and this we already know from an and world but now with the help of sam we are able to say that the same thing is also being observed in the snn world okay now another thing that we also were able to do using the sam visualization was that to understand whether a converted model and let's say a bntt or a surrogate gradient trained model has some different information that is being learned so we were able to compare the learning capability or the learning representation of a converted model with a bntt model 
and as you can expect that you know a bntt model is actually focusing on more interesting features and this is i'm showing for layer 4 and in a converted model it's more noisy so and this and again with the with layer 8 also if you see here in case of the lemon image the converted model is showing some very wrong visualizations whereas the surrogate or the bntt trained model is showing some very correct visualizations so what this tells us is that because of the fact that converted snns have been trained without using spike information they have been trained in the ann manner and then converted of course their interpretability using inter spike interval information will be low so that's why we cannot like so their interpretability is less right so that's what again the idea is that to understand where will snn fit now tomorrow if you want to deploy an snn in a edge device in a very very critical defense application you need to if you need to add some interpretability to it this is going to be useful a sam based visualization where you have trained this snn from scratch will be better because you know that in addition to your result you can actually interpret that result using these visualization tools okay so um uh, and as i said like you know this is just a metric to show you that the conversion has a higher error in terms of its visualization than uh, a surrogate gradient uh, model right um the other thing that we were also able to uh, get uh, is this very interesting behavior of sensory suppression of an snn when we visualized with uh, sam so what we found out is that in general in our brain when we see an image which has multiple objects of interest our brain focuses on one object and it kind of you know um, uh, uh, neglects the other objects and what we see is that snn also has this behavior so when you show it this concatenated image of a dog and a bird what we see is that if you look at if, if what what we see first of all the confidence score is that the snn actually predicts the um, object um, uh, b here which is the dog with a higher confidence and it does not even look at object a in this case which is bird and when we try to visualize with sam as to what is happening in the snn we found out that the snn is actually focusing on the dog for more number of time steps with whereas it is initially focusing on the bird but that focus goes away right so the sensory suppression behavior which is also very neurologically intact is also shown uh, seen in an snn and we are able to for the first time showcase this behavior and characterize this behavior using this interpretability tool okay uh, so before i go ahead so uh, there are a few questions i want to answer um sorry i'm not able to see the full question yeah uh, aisha has asked is there any published paper for bntt snn with segmentation and noise or for the result shown in the slide yes it is i will we will be um, uh, we, it is currently under review um, um i can i'll give you the archive link there is an archive link for it i'm going to give you the archive link aisha so can you just email me uh, later so that i can send you the archive link um then can we say that the spikes which are close to each other um they carry more inf important information yes with sam that's what we are trying to do and the spikes far away from each other have low or no correlation exactly and sam is able to capture that uh, that you know spikes that are closer have more information spikes that are uh, lesser have less information and spike and the spike activation map is actually able to leverage that uh, inter spike behavior in order to produce this visualization oh thanks aviral i am going to wrap it up um so i am going to now go on to like you know the robustness of an snn um so we know so this is a slide that tells you like you know when i tell robustness i'm going to focus on adversarial robustness now we already know that um adversarial attacks are pretty much a vulnerability dimension of ann's we know that like you know with adversarial attacks what is happening is that you add some structured perturbation to an image and it so happens that the same network which would predict that image with a high confidence now will mispredict it again with a high confidence so these adversarial perturbations are very very uh, interesting and i'm going to skip some of these slides in the interest of time but what is the main thing that we have found out from some of our recent works is that snns are generally more robust than ann's okay so what we find here if you compare between an ann and an snn which is trained with surrogate back propagation if you compare the accuracy okay we, i'm showing you the accuracy of the network as i increase the strength of the adversarial perturbation then the accuracy of the ann drops very steeply in comparison to the snn surrogate gradient and in and with respect to that bntt in fact has such good accuracy um um 
um, uh, you know, it's able to maintain its accuracy for a large strength of attacks. Okay, so this again tells you that as you incorporate more temporal information during the spike training process, you will be able to resist and bring in more robustness to the SNN. Okay, so there is some intrinsic robustness that we anyway see. On top of that, BNTT improves that intrinsic robustness even further. Okay, and we see the same kind of results in terms of even uh, when we just add Gaussian noise. So without even adding adversarial perturbation, if you see the accuracy drop uh, uh, versus the strength of the noise added for Gaussian noise, we see that an ANN has a steeper drop, right? Whereas a BNTT or a surrogate back propagation trained SNN has a much slower drop, right? Now, we wanted to understand that can SAM, now with the help of visualization, can we support this accuracy drop, right? That SNNs are more robust. Is there a reason why? So what we found out very interestingly is that when we applied a visualization grad cam tool to an ANN, before it was attacked versus after it was attacked, we found out that actually the network gets fooled because it focuses on the wrong part of the image. So after before attack, this network was focusing here, but after adversarial attack, the network started focusing on some wrong part of the image. That's why it got fooled. And earlier, if the accuracy was 60%, now the accuracy of the model dropped down to 10%, right? So this is what is happening. Now with SNN, however, we found out that the accuracy before attack and after attack was high, right? As I showed you that the SNNs are more robust. And the reason is that, that in terms of its visualization, we see that the SNN after attack is also able to focus on the right portion of the image. Then with the help of visualization, we were able to see that, right? So if you see the elephant image here, initially you see that the network is kind of getting confused, but you know, at later time steps, it starts more or less resembling the same visualization as it was before attack. So what does this tell us again? And again, for the dog image, the same kind of results. So what does this tell us is that SNN generally has higher robustness. With BNTT, we are able to improve this robustness even more. And SAM supports the performance drop that we get with such noisy samples, et cetera, okay? Uh, so um, now I'm just gonna give you like a very um, um, uh, uh, background that now that with the help of this BNTT training, we were not only able to tackle interpretability now, but we are able to now showcase that we can actually do federated distributed training with spiking neural networks. So we are trying to uh, showcase that, you know, we are trying to broaden the applicability uh, of SNNs for diverse learning scenarios. We are trying to do even privacy preserving distributed learning in SNNs. And it is all because of this BNTT learning rule that allowed us to kind of do temporal from scratch training with lesser number of time steps. Okay, so I'm going to skip some of these slides because uh, this was basically the federated learning results and some of the major results that we got from privacy preserving learning. But to summarize, I think that, you know, while SNNs do offer an energy efficient alternative, the main game changer can be if we come up with the best training technique and BNTT was one of them. There is of course other things that can come up, but from scratch training techniques that use temporal statistics can make a huge difference in widening the use of SNNs and even helping us interpret and making SNNs more uh, applicable for some um, hardware and some more uh, privacy, uh, uh, privacy or security uh, related scenarios. And as I said, while we are focused on just rate coding techniques, but there are other different code coding techniques that need to be also investigated further to induce more sparsity. Now, I want to finally like kind of conclude my results or conclude this uh, uh, education class by just give highlighting uh, some recent results from hardware that kind of will capture why is SNN algorithm development so important. So people here showed that as compared to a GPU or a CPU or a Jetson or a Movidius chip, when you implement an SNN on a Loihi or a neuromorphic hardware chip, the improvements in terms of energy you got is kind of, you know, 38x better or 2x better or 7x better than your state of the art GPUs or state of the art, you know, neural accelerator chips. Okay. So, so a neuromorphic hardware 
like whatever energy estimations i give you these are all analytical estimations but with the help of a neuromorphic hardware like intel loihi and loihi 2 was actually launched a couple of weeks ago right like not even couple of weeks 10 days ago september 31st is when they launched this and they are saying that you know they have an interesting framework etc that can give you uh, very good training capabilities and as i told you that training is still inefficient in snns so can actually this neuromorphic hardware that is being developed by so many companies and of course being generated from a lot of groups including my group can we actually come up with a suitable and compatible training framework that can take advantage of these snn algorithms and showcase the inference benefits as well as the training benefits remains the question okay and as and when we move strides in terms of hardware we will be actually able to move beyond these classification related tasks and go into the world of segmentation go into the world of uh, distributed learning federated learning uh, privacy security etc which are becoming more and more of a concern as we are moving towards um uh, you know um, uh, edge cloud uh, or ubiquitous intelligence so with that i would like to end uh, here are some key references all of the topics that i talked about batch normalization through time visualization etc they are all available as github codes uh, the visualization is also available so uh, you can mail me and i can send you the code we are going to be uh, putting it up on github very soon so thank you all and i am up for uh, if you have any questions uh, please feel free to ask right now and thank you all for attending this and thanks to the organizers for inviting me for doing this thank you so much Oh well, thank you Priya for doing this great talk uh, I was listening in for some part of the time so I was just going to make a quick announcement um, since you mentioned Loihi 2 we actually have a keynote tomorrow morning by Mike Davis who is the lead of the Intel's neuromorphic lab uh, I think he will be talking about Loihi 2 since that just came out as Priya mentioned so I encourage you to attend the keynote tomorrow morning if you want to hear more about that